All right, folks, welcome to Power Up Podcast Season 6, Episode 4, with me, your host, Nathan Shields. I have got a very good friend of mine on the podcast tonight, and that's Dalton Gilgamesh Fell, the head of Fight Fest in Kentucky. Dalton, say hi. Hey, everybody. How's it going? All right. So we're going to be talking about Fight Fest. We're going to talk about a lot of really cool stuff, maybe even some Pokemon Go, because... I haven't heard anything anywhere that even NPR talked about Pokemon Go today. So, you know, that's pretty crazy. So let's jump right into today's news segment. All right. So we'll see if we have some Pokemon Go time later. But first up... In recent news in the FGC, EVO 2016 is going to be on ESPN2. I personally was pretty hyped for that. I think that the FGC is sort of arriving at this place where it wants to be esports, to use that term. What was your take on that news, Dalton? It it honestly it blew my mind when I first uh, I saw the announcement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was more happy that uh, it wasn't. They announced that it wasn't behind a paywall anymore either. Like right. you can get the highest quality without uh, having to pay for it, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Did they make viewers pay last year? I don't remember. Um, you didn't have to pay to watch Evo, but if you wanted the highest quality video stream, mm-hmm. uh, that's what you had to pay for. You could watch it at like uh, the standard, uh, whatever the standard is on yeah. Twitch. But they they had it in like you know like 1080. Okay. Uh, behind a paywall, but this okay. year uh, I can't remember who they said's paying for it, but. Uh, it's not going to be behind a paywall. ESPN streaming it, mm-hmm. and I I think it's really good for the FTC, especially since it's like in Mandalay Bay, yeah. like to see this on TV. Because you know last year we were able to get a plug on ESPN with uh, the Woshige incident uh, yeah. for Guilty Gear. Yeah, so maybe now it'll be a little bit more positive coverage. And for the listeners out there, I apologize for the cameo of one of my dogs in the background. So there she goes. But what Sounds- can I do? <laughs> Sounds adorable. I know, right? She She's pretty adorable, but annoying. Anyways, <laughs> we'll see if she stops soon. Anyways, something cool. Speaking of like sports, ESPN2, the impact of storylines and whether or not they need to be authentic, the pro wrestling sort of, I don't know if you could call it a pride match that happened at CEO 2016 between Kenny Omega and Xavier Woods. I myself don't follow professional wrestling anymore. I used to when I was younger. But did you hear about that, Dalton? Oh, I watched it live. Yeah, it what did so you think? Awesome. Yeah, I loved it. They, I love yeah. I love Kenny Omega. I love New Day. So it was it was pretty funny to watch. One of my roommates is a super hardcore wrestling fan. Mm-hmm. I don't keep up with it as much anymore, but uh, I definitely keep up with like Kenny Omega and like the New Day because they're super <laughs> hardcore nerds. Yeah, I have seen that like, they dress up as Saiyans sometimes, right? Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. That's pretty cool. But he ended up losing, didn't he? Uh, Kenny Omega won. Oh, okay. uh, beat Xavier Woods. But I, I I think the more thing that I was more surprised at is Kenny Omega was a very solid player Mm -hmm. like he was very good uh xavier woods still uh still trying to reach uh the point but uh kenny omega knew combos he knew the right buttons to hit he wasn't you know just some guy that uh just you know walked in and was like i play fighting games no he he takes the time to practice he uh he actually said uh because of where he uh lives in japan uh, and Street Fighter Five not being in arcades, he takes a bullet train mm-hmm. to Tokyo to play with everyone, wow. and then gets up at six a.m. the next day to take a bullet train back for his match or the the training he has to do wow. for the match. Yeah, so he's he's very dedicated to the game. And uh, in an interview, I think he said it best: is um, if someone is going to give me the time. Uh, on stream or like to make a presentation Mm -hmm. I don't want to get up there and you know not please everybody right so yeah no absolutely that's really cool yeah I did see a little bit about how he had talked about spending time training I didn't realize that he was so kind of embedded in the community there in Japan that's really cool yeah he's definitely really good Uh, he, he definitely picks a 
the struggle bus character right mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. with uh, Alex being still kind of new to the game and uh, you know you know not really uh, struggling with a lot of matchups, but yeah. uh, he's definitely solid. I watch him uh, play Mike Ross for a little bit uh, mm-hmm. in like a Facebook stream chat. Oh. And uh, he was he beat him a couple times, and my, I heard Mike Ross go, "I'm very impressed right now." <laughs> so was... you were talking about the arcade scene in Japan, and that's a good segue for the next question. Since there is no arcade release in Japan for SF5, I've seen some articles talking about, I, I think from Daigo and maybe even Tokido, where they were talking about how that really sucks, and Daigo's even been sort of quoted. You know, translations are always kind of janky, but. The point was that Street Fighter V might not last as long as other games, or at least Japan might not be as good at it as others because there's no real, quote-unquote, arcade scene. Uh, what do you think of that stuff? Um, well, I went to Japan back in 2011 when I was in high school, mm-hmm. and I could definitely see that being an issue. The arcade scene is is huge in Japan. It's not mm-hmm. like, you know, what's left here... Uh, you know, you work at the uh, the arcade in Cincinnati, and mm-hmm. it it can be, it can be very tough in America uh, to get better at fighting games with online helping out as much as it can. But definitely the arcade culture in Japan, uh, it's just they're at a higher level. Even the casuals in Japan are at a higher level than some of the top players here in America. Yeah, and and because of that, uh, I I do agree that the game is is going to struggle in Japan if. Uh, Sony doesn't push Capcom to put it out there. No, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that Street Fighter V with the Capcom Pro 2 and everything, I think that it will be healthy. I don't think that anybody needs to worry about the game going away, and maybe those players are over-exaggerating a little bit, in my opinion, but they know their scene better than I know it. It just seems like with all the support the game's getting from the publisher that, I don't know, the lack of an arcade scene seems more like just a, a a strike against their normal way of training, and now they're in this position where they have to discover something new, new ways to gather and new places to gather, perhaps, I don't know. Yeah, in, in America, it can be a little, little different. Uh, I think definitely the American scene is showing up very strong, which... 5,000 entries at Evo, uh, you know, I can only assume, I want to say at least, you know, more than half of that is America, you know, uh, and then, you know, we probably have at least maybe a thousand foreign players, you know, and I, I do think what, uh, I think Tokido said it, the game will continue to do healthy as long as the publisher, uh, keeps putting money in it, Mm -hmm. uh, which, I mean, that's any game for the matter, a game will stay healthy. Uh, but I can see where they come from with their just like it's it's gonna struggle in Japan because that's just a culture that has been there since the ninety you know the late eighties or early nineties. No, yeah, exactly, and I think that that you know again it just really comes down to them taking and learning new ways to train. I think so, anyways. So I don't think that Street Fighter Five and its life is gonna get cut tragically short or anything like that. Definitely not. They've definitely been trying some different stuff, especially with uh, Daigo doing Beast TV now. Yeah. That uh, there seems to be at least a healthy scene where they live mm-hmm. for the game. Uh, but as far as like the countryside of Japan goes, I don't know how well that is. Because when yeah. was the last time we heard anything from... Uh, what was the El Forte player in Pepe Ultra Street? Yeah, Pepe. Yeah. He, he lived out in the middle of the sticks in Japan and... I haven't heard anything from him since Street Fighter V dropped. Yeah, yeah, that's very that's an interesting point. Maybe it has narrowed down the number of players, not necessarily the quality, but the but the quantity. That could be. Hmm. Interesting. Well, something to think about and mull over and kind of watch and see as Street Fighter V goes from being a year to two years, three, four. Who knows how old it might get. So, yeah, it'll be interesting for sure. Have you seen Novril Tataki's Guilty Gear Guides on YouTube? Uh, no, the only Guilty Gear Guides I've seen are the Guilty Bits. Okay. I think that the the new ones, I don't think they're called Guilty Bits anymore, but he's been releasing stuff for Ixert and now Revelator. That's pretty cool. I actually supported him 
and his team on Patreon. So that's been pretty cool. And I haven't really sifted through all the videos yet, but I'm looking forward to it. And I think that I'll, I'll have a lot to learn. And that, that seems like a good training. It seems like a good resource to use is Novril's guides. I've always enjoyed them. They're very well produced. In my opinion. Oh, his guides are amazing. I love yeah. them. They're very Absolutely. entertaining too. They are, yeah. I love the little chibi art and he's got, I think, a team of five or diff so different people who are working on different aspects of the video and then he's in charge of actually recording and then having the script ready. So that's pretty cool. Are there any games that you are particularly looking forward to this upcoming fall and into next year? Um, I, I just want to see what Killer Instinct has on the horizon mm -hmm. this, this month for the last character. Yeah, they did <laughs> that poll, right? Did you participate in the poll? Oh, of course I did. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. They've got a lot of characters in that game. Do you think that well maybe we can save that question more for the community segment about let me write that one down like the future of ki i think we oh, can yeah. that's we can save that, that for there yeah definitely a big community game for ki yeah okay cool well we'll talk about that during the community segment last thing for new segment pokin tournament do you think that it is the type they recently announced some DLC for it? So I'm excited, actually, hopefully, to see some cool stuff from those new character, new Pokemon. And do you think it's going to survive into Evo 2017? Just like gut feeling. I mean, the the way I see it is, I, I see it going one of two ways. Mm -hmm. uh, if Nintendo keeps putting money into it, yes. Yeah. Or I could see it being overtaken by King of Fighters, mm. but I could also see Killer Instinct being taken out for Kill King of Fighters. Yeah, yeah. So it, it can go either way for that game. However, Pokin did get over a thousand entries this year, and Ki only got five hundred or so. Okay. Granted, it's it's up a fair amount from the previous year. It went right. up like thirty six percent. Oh, cool. Uh, because of the PC release, of course. Yeah. Um, but, I don't know, Pokemon is one of those those games where it's like, it can go either way. I know the Smash uh, community was really big on it at first, but now it seems like they've kind of dropped off of it, and, like, Pokemon is just, like, their own, like, type of scene now. You yeah. play Pokemon, you don't really play Pokemon and Smash. It's like, yeah. oh, I play Pokemon, or I play, it seems like I play Tekken and Pokemon. <laughs> uh, but, uh... Um, right. I, I think the game is fun, and I, I could see it uh, being there next year. Mm -hmm. How big it's going to be next year honestly depends on Nintendo, I think. Yeah, yeah. the publisher involvement is getting to be more and more a key to the victory, key to the survival. Like you said, key to the survival of a game. Take MKX, for instance. It's had plenty of complaints from players about, oh, 50-50 this, oh, inescapable that, but... $50,000 pot bonuses spread out across top 32 or 64 or however they do it and that is keeping people interested in that game for sure. I'm interested to know what's going to happen with Injustice 2 if they're going to keep supporting MKXL or if they're going to shift everything over to Injustice because historically that scene has always just transferred to the next game and the next game and never have there been two games persisting at the same time for the quote-unquote NRS community. Well, uh, NRS did announce that they were going to have some news from Mortal Kombat yeah. at EVO. So people are hoping it's MK Pac 3 and then I can only assume they're going to have Injustice news as well. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see. They they don't want to completely stop supporting the game, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know. Like you always have those diehard Mortal Kombat fans because you know Injustice is back to block, while Mortal Kombat is you know you hold the button to block. Uh, yeah. So you you always have those people that will be dedicated MKX fans, and then you have the people that will be like transition into Injustice because that's kind of maybe they enjoy Injustice more. I know like uh, some of the Lexing people here. Uh, they don't really like uh, Mortal Kombat, but they'll play Injustice. They love Injustice. Hmm. Interesting. 
Well, folks, that pretty much concludes the news segment. So things to keep a lookout for on the horizon. News about Street Fighter V and its popularity. Is it going to survive for four or five years? Who knows? And then, of course, Pokin. What's going to happen next year? Keep your eyes on that DLC. And then, of course, Killer Instinct and Mortal Kombat X and Injustice. What are the futures of those games? So keep your ears glued to the ground. SRK event hubs, you know, different forums, and find out what's going to happen. All right, so that was a good news segment. We're going to move on now to today's strategy segment. All right, Dalton, so let's talk about Killer Instinct and actually playing it. So what are some of the higher level skills needed for Killer Instinct? You you jump in, you've learned how to do some linkers, maybe some manual combos. What's the next step for a player? Um, well, personally, the the way I play the game is um, reads, because I play a grappler type character. Technically, she is kind of mix-up heavy. Uh, I try to read the opponent, engage what they're going to do, uh, when they're going to jump, try to see if I can knock them out. Maybe I know they're scared so I can go for a grab. Mm-hmm. The game is, uh, I think uh, Red Muffler Man said it best. He's like, you know why you're good at that game, Dalton? And I was just like, why? Because that game is everything you want in a character. It just the game mechanics is you like hard reads. Ah. And that game rewards you very well for hard reads. Yeah, I can see that because it does give you the ability to get out if you make the incorrect read. It gives you that ability. Hmm. Yeah, and, uh, in a combo, if I know they're going to break, you mm-hmm. know, you get rewarded for it very well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, especially with general, I haven't uh, really been playing much KI lately. I've been uh, packing up the move, and mm-hmm. my Xbox Live is out right now. Mm-hmm. So I haven't really played as much. But before, uh, you know, it went out, I played General Rom a bit online. Mm-hmm. That character... Is so scary. <laughs> he, he's the first true crappler the game has. Yeah, like he's slow. He uh, he, you know, he has very slow buttons. Mm-hmm. But he can. If you get locked out and he has instinct, you're dead. There's yeah. he'll do ninety percent right there. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I saw one very interesting mix-up video where the goal was to use his instinct to cover his normal so it was harder for the opponent to know what to break and that was pretty crazy to me oh yeah you you always pick black general rom color yeah <laughs> always that, that's such a crazy meta game choice you know always pick black general that's that's man that's really cool though it is uh like i remember like in season season 2 late season 1 Base would always pick Dark Spinal on a Spinal stage, and he would be uh. really hard to see. <laughs> so, like, eventually it got to a point where anytime people played him, they're like, no, we're not playing on that stage. Nice. <laughs> Did that ever evolve into a conversation about banning stages in KI? No, they never really okay. banned stages in KI. It was always, like, kind of hard to see Spinal, mm-hmm. but it wasn't to the point where it's just like, no. Yeah, yeah, and and bass was probably a good sport about it, and just picked a different yeah, he, stage. Yeah, he he never really cared. He just he did it more as a trolley thing. I than got anything. you. Sure. So it was always really funny though. I'm sure he'll do it to somebody in Evo pools if he'll be attending. So there you go. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. So hard reads. What about training methods? How do you how do you train your brain to make hard reads multiple times in a match? Um. Honestly, the my training method for the game is like when I first like learned Hisako mm-hmm. is like I learned her like basic combos, I learned some setups, and then I just I played online. Yeah. I played online, I played online and I played online more. And then when I found a new trick with Hisako, I would go into training mode for a little mm-hmm. bit, figure it out, and then I would get right back online and try to do it to someone. Yeah. And the Killer Instinct is really one of those games where everyone's like Oh well, you know, you should be a training mode monster. Killer Instinct is one of those games where I'm like, you should definitely hit up training mode. But Killer Instinct is one of those games where it's just like, you benefit from playing people like so much more yeah. than any other game I have ever played in my life. Yeah, it 
you know, because you have to you have to learn counter breakers, you have to learn combo breakers. You know, you can learn all that stuff in training mode, but that's that's not a human being. Right. They're like, you know, you play a computer online and it's it's going to automatically be like, you know, before you even like fully hit the button, you know, it's sensors re- the Xbox is going to read, the game is going to read before you even hit that button, it's going to know what it is and break it. Yeah. And it's like that's not even humanly possible. <laughs> Yeah, you make a good point about wanting to, it's kind of a, when you somebody plays Street Fighter, they'll spend a lot of time in training mode. Mortal Kombat, you spend a lot of time in training mode because you want to perfect your combos, but Killer Instinct, of course, like you said, you need to spend time in training mode, but you don't have to spend as much time because the combos are very malleable and really what you do is either setup based or... It just depends on how you want to get that read on your opponent, and you're using different things, different buttons, different combinations almost constantly. And to me, it seems a lot like Pokin Tournament, because in Pokin, the combos aren't extremely complex. There are, there are some setups and things that you can learn with different characters, but overall, you, you're in training mode a little bit at a time, but then really, you go out and play, because... It's really just hard to have a computer replicate getting around. For example, I play Chandelure. It's really hard to have a computer replicate getting around Chandelure zoning. So you really have to have that human opponent to really learn the game in earnest, I believe. So for me, I, I kind of draw a parallel between KI and Pokémon Tournament that way. I can see that. Mm. I remember uh, I was. Uh, have you heard of the the player called KI for Life? No, I haven't. He's, he's a he's a pretty good Hisako player. He's from I can't remember where he's from. He's from I think the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. But he's coming out the Evo. He's a very big part of the KI community. And I ran into him online, and I ended up having the Hisako mirror with him. Mm-hmm. And it was it was really funny because you know all games are two out of three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was able to beat him the first game, and then he destroyed me the second game. So the you know the third game was coming up, mm-hmm. and I, I was like I decided to be like. I'm going to try something different with this character that I have never really tried before. Yeah. And I sat there and I hit normals and he's, I heard him through his headset because I think he was streaming. Yeah. And he goes, I don't understand this. Sasako's using normals. <laughs> <laughs> and after I kind of freaked him out a little bit when he was trying to like go in a little bit and I would just like poke him. Yeah. I just held forward essentially and just uh-huh. went for crazy mix ups and I was able to beat him and <laughs> Uh, he's he's really good. He's I think he's a better Hisako than me. Mm-hmm. I was just able to kind of freak him out a bit and sure. make him sit too much. Yeah. Like it's very bad to sit with Hisako mm. in certain matchups, and the mirror mm. is one of them. <laughs> Interesting. Very cool. So you kind of you change your game plan to more of a sort of almost like a footsies based sort of plan. Something to maybe would you even say a little bit more reactionary? Were you reacting more to what he was doing? Yeah, I was reacting mm-hmm. to a lot more of what he was doing, which is like I, I, I like I said, I play based on hard reads and what I like what I really like to look for in a character is a character with a command grab. Yeah. And a character that I can hold forward with. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And that's why I really like Hisako. She has command grab. I can hold forward with her and do a lot of crazy shenanigans. Yeah, and I like I love really rush down heavy characters. That's why I I, uh, I actually picked up Raven uh, when Revelator came out. Mm-hmm. How's that been going for you? Oh, I love the character. Nice. <laughs> he's so fun. He's got two command grabs. He's got Oki. Mm-hmm. I can hold forward. He's very aggressive. Cool. Uh, it's it's fun. I love the game. Uh, Rev Revelator. I've actually been playing a lot more Revelator uh, than any other game. Sure, it's like said- new. Yeah, because uh, like I said, Killer, you know, I don't really, I can't play Killer Instinct online right now, so Rev has uh, kind of been my baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty proud, I ran into Marlin Pie online, and I had to make him pick uh, Zato. Nice. So I was pretty proud of that, but then he picked Zato, and I got perfect it twice. Oh, I was, wow. I was like, well, at least I can beat his Johnny and Soul. <laughs> there you go, nice. So, so with Revelator... Let's do kind of the same question. What's your training method? What's the best practices for learning Revelator, in your opinion? Uh, Revelator is definitely one of those games that uh, I say to be a training mode monster on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
the online for the game is way better than what sign was. So I definitely say nice. hop online. Um, what, what stinks about the game um, is ranked is dead. Like ranked in that game is dead. Really? <laughs> it's been dead since sign. Like when sign came out, people tried it at first. The online wasn't too good. Yeah. So when Rev came out, it's it's just still dead. Huh. In the way the have you have you played Rev online? Not yet. I've been in training mode, and uh, <laughs> I'll get to ranked eventually. But now I'm now I'm wondering if it's going to be worth my time. The oh, it tr- the lobby system in that game mm-hmm. is the coolest thing ever. Oh, it's, okay. Uh, it, well, it's still sixty four man lobbies. Whoa. And you have an avatar that walks around. Right, right. It's so fun. You can, like, fish, and, like, you can join player rooms, and the player rooms are, like, eight people. Mm-hmm. And it, it is, I think, honestly, other than uh, KI, KI with, like, its netcode, mm-hmm. Rev probably has some of the best netcode out right now. I think it's better than Street Fighter V's netcode currently. Nice. Um, I mean, I've played with, I've been able to play with some people from Japan with yeah. only about, like, a four-frame drop, which mm-hmm. isn't too bad. Sure. But uh, in Revelator, definitely, if anything is over six frames in that game, I'd, I'll leave the lobby. Yeah, I understand. And I guess it, it tells you then as well. Yeah, the game still tells cool. you. It's a lot more accurate mm. than it was in Sign. Because in Sign, <laughs> when it said, like, four frames, honestly, you were probably about seven or eight. Uh. Uh, but the new one, they updated it. It's a lot more accurate. Uh, you know, three frames is more than likely three to four frames. Mm-hmm delay and I, I love it the net code is way better nice like i said i play with marlon pie who lives in like california and mm-hmm. i think we only had like a three frame like you know it was like three frames yeah not so, so bad. it was pretty nice um but you know definitely that game is a training mode monster and you know guilty gear is still one of those games where like combo videos emerge online and you see yeah. crazy stuff um, but I say definitely, like, you know, try to be a training mode monster in that game. Mm-hmm. But the net code is way better than what it used to be. So definitely hop online, learn matchups, get on dust loop, you know, you know, learn, oh, yeah. learn to fight. Like, you know, if you don't really have a healthy scene around where you live, uh, definitely that game is one of the games that I would recommend playing online with other people. Nice. So it sounds like Ranked's got a bad rap and now it's really improved and people should take the time to check it out. Yeah, I think people should check out Ranked in that game. It's fun, but the the way the lobbies are in that game, mm-hmm. they're they're just like more heavy and like that's just kind of what the I guess guilty your community gravitated towards is just like I don't want to play some random stranger when I can open up a lobby with eight people sure. and like you know I'll just rotate and I can get more matchup experience. Yeah, that's true. Nice. But, uh, it's it's fun. I really I really enjoy uh, the lobby system in that game, and the new uh, method to unlock DLC in that game is mm-hmm. so much better. Okay, what is uh, that? You can uh, okay you you uh, you remember in Sign, uh, you got these things called World Dollars, mm-hmm. and that's how you unlocked Sin without paying for him. Right, right. Well, Raven is in the game uh, now. Uh, Coom is the DLC character you have to pay for now. Mm. You, she, she was free up until the twenty first of June. Mm-hmm. Now she's like four ninety nine, right? And uh, you can unlock Raven as well for two ninety nine, mm. but he's already in game, and you can unlock him with World Dollars. Mm. But uh, they have a thing called fishing in the game, and it oh, costs right. two hundred World Dollars for one single fish, mm-hmm. and then two thousand World Dollars for normal fishing. And you can unlock colors, you can unlock music, you can unlock Raven, actually. Hmm. Uh, just randomly, if you don't want to spend 200,000 world dollars on him, you can just right. try to fish for him. <laughs> There's a bunch of funny like artwork going around online yeah. of like Melia fishing with her hair and pulling Raven out of the water. <laughs> so it's pretty entertaining. Yeah. Uh, but I love the fishing system. It's really cool. I've unlocked hmm. so many colors and music just by fishing. Yeah. And it's actually pretty enjoyable, you know, you're like sitting there and you're just like, ah, I got like, you know, like a hundred thousand world dollars, I should probably spend some of this, try to unlock colors and stuff. And sure. it's definitely a lot better than being like, how much is this song? Four thousand world dollars. Right. Well, I could probably unlock more just by fishing. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And I highly recommend like fishing right now because you can get some like DLC stuff, mm-hmm. colors that are only DLC, like you have to pay for. Oh, wow. Nice. 
And I highly recommend doing that because it's a pretty busted system right now. Yeah. And I can see them trying to patch it in the future. <laughs> get, so, them, get them while fishing's good, right? Yeah, I highly recommend it. <laughs> nice. Well, that's very cool. So for the takeaway from the strategy segment, go out there and try Revelator's Ranked Mode. Fish for some, for some colors and characters and all kinds of cool stuff. And this distinction between games that are training mode heavy and then not so training mode heavy. So you don't have to approach each and every game quite the same way. That's an interesting distinction. Yeah. Uh, with Street Fighter Five, did you uh, hear they wanted to... Or Tokido said, don't play online for the game. And I found that very interesting for our community, for the American community, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he just recommends training mode and locals. Hmm. I, I didn't hear that, but I, I can't... I just can't do that, first of all. So, you know... If I wanted to be Tokido, I guess I'd take his advice. Yeah. But for for me, I like playing ranked Street Fighter V. It's not always the best experience, but I feel like I get matchup experience. And I don't know. Maybe, but, yeah. Yeah, I found that very interesting news, uh, especially like with my, like like you said, my ideology of, you know, you shouldn't approach every game the same right. with training um, but it's very interesting to hear a player like Tokido say that. Yeah, it is definitely. Well, I guess when you've got, you know, more time to play, I don't know what his schedule is, but if, if you've got more time to play and dedicate to it, then maybe his method is the best. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Hmm. People would have to go out and try it. Well, all right, that was excellent. Let us start now today's community segment. <laughs> Right. So, Dalton, as the head organizer, right, of Fight Fest, tell us more about Fight Fest and Fandom Fest. Um, we're at the Fair and Expo Center this year mm-hmm. in, in Louisville, Kentucky, naturally. That's where we've been the past couple of years. Yes. And um, I'm really excited this year because uh, thanks to the Kentucky Battle Circuit, KBC, we have a $100 mm-hmm. pop bonus uh, for Street Fighter Five. Nice. And um, I haven't... Uh, I was going to announce it in the trailer, but I can announce it on here because mm-hmm. uh, the trailer should be done tonight. Oh, cool. Uh, Stan Lee, uh, if you win Marvel, uh, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, first place gets to meet Stan Lee. Whoa. And uh, get an autograph and a picture, just like we did in 2013, the first year I did it. Cool. So it'll be, it's very exciting because it's going to be Stan Lee's like last time, one of his last times traveling yeah. the U.S., and then he's just going to stay in California for the rest of his shows. Yeah. And uh, that's crazy that you mentioned that because just a few days ago I was watching Tested online, Adam Savage's new show. Now that he's done with Myth- MythBusters, and I was watching an old episode from Comic Con. They were talking about the Stan Lee line, and anyways, to make a long story short, I was just wondering to myself, you know, Stan Lee's getting up there, and I wonder how many more times he's going to be traveling around and my question is now answered so he's going to be sticking to california for a while as well indefinitely then yeah his last out of town show is going to be in october at new york comic-con wow well the man has done more than his fair share of cons so i think he deserves to be done and he'll probably still go to cons just in california so if you want to see stan lee go to cali there you go oh yeah Nice. Well, very cool. What about the anything else cool? Any other particular goals or news you'd like to share about Fight Fest this year? Um, I'm hoping to. Uh, last year we reached uh, 120 entries individually. Mm-hmm. So this year I'm hoping to at least get 150, 160. Okay. Definitely come out. Uh, it's only I only do it on Saturday, so mm-hmm. like. Uh, people can enjoy the convention if they want to come out or if they just want to come for the games. You know, they can only come Saturday. And hopefully, uh, you know, in the future I can uh, expand Fight Fest to be something beyond uh, fandom, which yeah. is the goal eventually. Yeah. But definitely I I really appreciate fandom for, you know, helping me out in any way, form, you know. Yeah. They, they, they get the venue and I just kind of do uh, my own thing and they – have all the monitors and stuff and the community really helps out with uh, fight fest in general and 
you know, I try to do my best in everything I do. It's really fun every year. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of uh, what made me actually what really made me want to do uh, major was like the first time I went to Power Up. Oh, nice. Uh, the 2012. Mm -hmm. That was my first major. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like I liked. <laughs> I just remember uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, mm -hmm. and my friend was playing Chris G, and Chris G was destroying him. While watching the Street Fighter movie you had on. Oh, wow. In the corner. He's like, what is Akuma doing over there? And he was just destroying him. Oh, no. And I couldn't help but laugh. And that's like one of the, like uh, my best major memories. And I was like, I want a major to be fun like that. You had a movie playing. Yeah. You know, the arcade was there. And this, the whole idea of, I guess we could actually, if you wanted to, we could segue in the idea of a Comic-Con doing esports now which has become a huge thing actually mm -hmm, sure with yomacon you know been doing it for a couple of years now and now mm -hmm. wizard world mm -hmm. is super behind it yeah wizard world is putting that cash out there like five five grand here seven grand here and it's e like you know esports is becoming a thing but now it seems like comic cons are adopting like not really i guess you say esports but the idea of video games becoming bigger at events. Yeah. It seems like. And well, in that vein, maybe the future of Fight Fest is with Fandom Fest. Perhaps. It, yeah, I I could see that being a thing uh, as well as uh, maybe fandom wanting to expand Fight sure. Fest into something even bigger or you know, maybe just giving it like, you know, fandom fest and like you know like video game huge expo type thing like mm -hmm. wizard world does like wizard world comic-con and gaming expo now is like yeah. that it's what I they had, call themselves i had done an event that was not successful in fall of 2012 after power up 2012 because i wanted to try something different i wanted to do a more convention type thing so i invited some artists and some vendors out and, you know, the event wasn't successful because apparently I had just misscheduled. Everybody went to Yumacon that year, but I didn't really pour much of any money into it. But that idea of doing something more like a convention type thing and not just the fighting game tournament was an idea that I had been inspired by UFGT. And when Keats was running it, how UFGT had almost this sort of it had like a side room full of kind of carnival games, which was really cool. And the idea that the tournaments themselves were not really the only or maybe even the main attraction for some guests was something that appealed to me. And that's why I tried that event. And who knows, maybe sometime in the future. But yeah, I think that it's really cool that conventions are taking those steps to make competitive video gaming something more acceptable and more entrenched in their plans. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I, it's happening with major tournaments as well because if mm -hmm. you look at uh, CEO, oh, yeah. they have a huge artist alley now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's becoming... I always liked the idea of... Even Evo does it now. I always wanted to... I like the idea of panels yeah. at at events yeah uh stuff like you know maximilian does his panel and like mm -hmm. he fills up a huge room of people mm -hmm. you know and you know like these fgc the idea of like fgc celebrities like micro Gutex, maximilian and like they have panels you know it it's the whole culture is able to intermingle very well yeah i guess is the best word to put it because you have people that would love to meet Benny the dog. Yeah, I would, I would love to meet Benny. <laughs> uh, and it's 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 really nice to see it. I guess finally coming together in like uh, very very fast, actually very fast. And mm -hmm. you know, there's there doesn't seem to really be any big problems with it. it it's merging very well, and yeah. people seem to really love the idea. Um, the only thing I could see, like maybe in the future, like having an issue. I don't know what Wizard World, uh, the Comic Con and Gaming Expos cost. I don't because you know Comic Cons tend to be uh, a bit higher in the price of what people normally intend to pay, unless it's something like Evo. Right. Um, 
that's one of the issues I wish uh, fandom would do a video game badge. Yeah. Because, you know, Comic-Cons are just, they're expensive. It's like $40 mm-hmm. for the day Saturday, and that's why I like to put it on one day because, right. you know, people can just come for the games or come all weekend if they choose to. Yeah. And uh, that's why I like uh, Yomacons. Uh, they just have a video game badge. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I think, 30 to $35, and then 40 at the door, which is normally traditional it's actually a little bit cheaper than what a lot of places do now for like late registration mm-hmm. i remember at final round late registration was like 65 dollars yep so it was it's it's working out very well and i i would just i would like to see like maybe comic cons do like video game badges yeah. if they make it something even bigger than you know uh what it is yeah there's a player in dayton an old school player uh, mostly stru- Super Turbo, and then every once in a while he'll come out to play a new Street Fighter when it releases. But his name is Frank, and he goes by the handle Roy Bizzle. Oh, yeah, I and, know Roy. Yeah, and so every once in a while he would talk to me, and his idea was similar to what you're saying in that you want to provide the patrons, the guests, with the with more value for their dollar. And by showing them that value they'll be more comfortable spending the dollars and i like how your idea combines with that where it says well let them pay for what they want to participate in and have a video game badge and to me that is a really great way to have the guests themselves add value to the event it makes it harder for the organizer as far as budgeting concerns go because you're not quite sure what to spend on because you're not quite sure what people are going to want and then potentially increase of their own volition the entry that they pay. So it can be tougher for the community organizer, the organizer behind it, but if you've got the backing already or the administrative structure already of a con, then that sort of risk is a little mitigated because the con is already attracting more people who are paying full price for all the other things and then the video game aspect is not really it's not the headliner it's cool and it could be really awesome but it's not the big headline and i think that still leaves room for tournaments that are just turn just brackets i think that that leaves room for smaller organizers to say hey this is just going to be a cheaper event. Come out and play, have a good time, you know, train a little bit. And yeah, I think that that leaves a pay gap. That's probably not the right word. It leaves the option for cheaper events and thus allows grassroots, even like smaller, super grassroots, budding roots, if you want to call them. It leaves room for those events and those organizers to still kind of do their thing, I think. Yeah, that's why I believe Yomacon does so well is because they have that option, mm-hmm. and it it's it's really good to like start off at least, and you know maybe if you're the one that brings it to the convention and you decide to uh, branch off or maybe stay there, and then they help you and support you more. You know they want to help you grow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've got two more questions for the community segment. We're running a little bit long on this segment, but it's been really awesome conversation. So. I'm not even worried about it. So first, let, we'll talk about KI second. First, I'd like to ask you a question about coaching. There was recent news. Evo 2016 had, or sorry, SRK ran a news article about an actual FGC coach being hired onto Team Liquid, I believe. Hopefully I got that right. I don't have it up in front of me. But yeah, anyways, it was Team Liquid. Yeah, so he's a Smash Brothers Melee coach. And... What I found odd about that, and I posted about it on the Power Up Facebook page, was that SRK, and they were transparent about it. They said, you know, you know, this is cool and all, but you can't use coaches at all events like Evo 2K16, for instance. And it prompted me to post something, I'm not going to do it verbatim, but it was along the lines of, well, so SRK is running this news article that is basically saying that coaches could be good for esports and the FGC. But then you're not going to allow coaches in quarterfinals and beyond. You're still going to allow them in pools, apparently, which seems reverse logic to me. 
And then they still have the rule, the official rule that is on their website that states that in between matches of a set, players can take up to 60 seconds to just do whatever. And I just, I don't know. For me, I think coaching enriches the community, and I know that some people will disagree with me. What side of this do you fall on? Do you think coaching is good or bad or somewhere in the middle? I think coaching is, is really good, and mm-hmm. it's really good for the community. It's it's one of those, I mean, everyone has a coach boxing, yeah, you know, stuff like that. Like, you know, sports, if we want to be esports, have coaches. It's, it's very... It's very common. Uh, it's funny that you mention that because I got one comment on that post, and I encourage anybody listening, hit me up on Facebook, throw some comments down. This particular commenter had said something. He was on the other side, so he would disagree with us, and it's a shame I can't do like just call-ins. I, I don't really do those, but his thing was that he compared the FGC to tennis, and apparently, and I didn't know this, but in tennis... If coaches are caught sending signals to players, they could get in a lot of trouble. And I just kind of wondered what the rationale is for that. I mean, maybe the coaches still get a chance to talk to the player, not during the match, but between matches? I I don't know the details of that. It's something I'd have to look into more. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more with you where other sports have coaches. You can kind of take time in between and I'm not encouraging cheating by coaches of course not that would be cheating I'm encouraging the use of a coach to improve the gameplay and he also said something this particular commenter he said something about it being a barrier to entry in the FGC if coaches are allowed and I found that to be very interesting because I don't know. I don't think that it's really a barrier to entry. I mean, sure, you could pay someone really good to be your coach, but if you haven't put in the time and you don't have the mentality and the training behind you, it doesn't matter how much money you spend on a coach, you're still not going to win, no matter what that coach tells you to do, in my opinion. That, that's that's how I feel like on it, is, is the idea of a coach will help. Like, they're like hey, they're, sure. they're doing... Uh, crouching medium too much so like if you see a back dash and then go for an overhead right. or something and you know you can tell me that however I might not be able to react to it personally mm-hmm. it, it'll help but that doesn't mean that you'll win the match at all it, it just doesn't unless you're um, you know PR wrong or something where you right. just you know you yeah, put somebody a- who's already had the time put in who can really take that advice and do something with it so yeah, it's very interesting. Maybe I should try to have that gentleman on the podcast and talk to him. Just have like a special 15, 20 minute mini podcast about coaching. And then that we would, could like go back and forth. That'd be pretty cool, actually. That'd be cool. Yeah. Cool. Kind of like a, a left, right, and center from NPR. I love NPR, so sorry to all you folks. <laughs> the references will only get more and more but as the podcast goes on. But yeah, it's like left, right, and center. You got one person on this side, one person on this side. And then I guess I couldn't really be in the middle, but I could try to be neutral. I could at least try to like be a see moderator. Both sides. Yeah, I'd be a moderator. That'd be really cool. I, I might have to explore that. Well, all right. So that's interesting. Uh, I'm glad that we agree about coaching stuff. So that's cool. But okay. So you wanted to talk about the future of KI. They ran that poll. Talk to me. What's going on? Um. Well, one of the pool, one of the characters was uh, Joanna Dark. Yeah. Which I, I personally think would be real cool. However, uh, I don't want to. I, I think there's enough guest characters already in the game. There's three, and uh, as much as I, I like the characters they have, I think there's enough. I would like to see room for like another new character mm-hmm. because we've only had one this season. We had, mm, you know, yeah. returning characters. We've had guest characters, but we've only had one new character, Mira. Yeah. And the character, honestly, out of all the design choices in the entire game, I think she has the best design and the best like move set. And, and I personally, it's because she's new. Yeah. And I just think it's awesome. Um, I'm trying to remember the character I voted number one for. I had Joanna Dark second, but mm-hmm. I can't remember the number one character I, I wanted. But um. I wish I could remember because it just sounded cool and I was like, that sounds awesome. I voted in that poll too and I don't recall. 
I'm sure you could probably just search through your your tweet history. Or no, wait, since it's a never mind, you couldn't do that because it was like a survey monkey thing. I think. Oh well. Well, we'll yeah. see. So, do you think that Ki needs characters to survive? Does it need more money into the Ki World Cup? What's the next step for the Ki community, in your opinion? Uh, the next step for the Ki community. <sighs> The game has grown so much in such a little time with the drop yeah. of the PC release. And it, it's hard to say, to see where the community is going. Uh, I hope more people try the game out and it just gets bigger. Like I, I really think the game deserves a better spotlight in yeah. some instances, which is what the KR World Cup does. You know, Brandon Alexander, you know, puts so much love into the game and mm-hmm. puts, you know, time in it. And it's 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 amazing. I love it. And the game, uh, to be honest, the game, I feel like the game only has a season three um, because of Microsoft wanting to back it so much because of Street Fighter. Sure. And I feel like the only reason they were uh, willing to back it is like um, they, they were like, we want guest characters in it. And, you know, mm-hmm. I feel like we want Rash, we want Arbiter in it, we want General Rom in it because it, it, it opens the door for other players to try it out in like more casual setting you know like i guarantee you like people that love halo bought it i guarantee you people that love battletoads for nostalgia bought it and people that love killer instinct were just like or uh that love gears of war was like general rom's gonna be in a fighting game that sounds (laughs) awesome exactly and of all the characters i think rom fits the best out of the characters chosen nice uh and it's the the community as a whole um needs to grow in the idea of I feel more people need to go outside and go to like their majors sure because that's the one thing the KI community struggles with mm. is we'll get you know we'll get Evo you know we'll get a good amount of people sure. for Evo however for like something like final round where do you expect a good amount of people I think it had under like 120 oh, wow. for a major of a final rounds caliber mm. and mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's very disappointing especially when you see these online tournaments get over 200 people, which granted these they're they're free, and I understand why you enter. Yeah, but it's not hard to be like, I can only go to one major a year, okay, but you don't go to it, right? Uh, it's because they're expensive. We'll start saving a year in right. advance. Yep, to go to one major, that one major you really want to go to, because yeah. uh, this year. Uh, we've decided we're not going to final round. Uh, we're going to CEO. Hmm. So you know what I'm doing starting in August? Saving. Saving for June. There you go. So, That's the smart man's bet for sure. Very good. And, and you know, I, I want to go to other majors too. Mm-hmm. So I'll save for those. But naturally, what's the most expensive trip going to be? It's going to be driving to Florida. Yep. Staying in a hotel in Florida and. <laughs> Uh, you know, I definitely plan. I want to go to KIT this year as well, or well, technically next year. Yeah, I want to go to Frosty Faustings, and I'm more than likely. Uh, I may overshadow. I want to go to CEO, but it may overshadow. And I am very determined to go to the KI World Cup this year. Ooh, nice! Because it's uh normally they have qualifiers there, and if I don't, mm-hmm. you know, qualify through some other means miraculously, <laughs> I would like to try to qualify there, especially because um. It's not just the KR World Cup. It's a convention. Yeah. Killer Instinct convention. Yeah. So he's he's definitely uh, embracing the idea of not just the game, but the Killer Instinct culture as well, I guess you could say, from yeah. the 90s love and the comic books and everything at a convention. It's going to be fun. Uh, I know last year he had a cosplay contest, so I can only assume this year he's going to have a cosplay contest as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's and it, it's he's at like the exposition center in Texas. Cool. So, uh, it's it's very exciting, and I definitely want to go to that. That's one of those things where um, I'll definitely have to you know fly out to. And um, it's 
uh, it's just like I, I get excited thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, for all the listeners out there, we'll have links to all these things. If you're at all interested in KI, every time I post a KI video on my weekend shows, I include the link to Infill's guide online. In my opinion, the best killer instinct guide you can find oh, on it's the such internet. Good. It really is super awesome. And then you, Dalton, uh, every once in a while you will do the Instinct series talking about upcoming KI events, uh, KI characters, releases, things like that. And I think that is, you know, part of what needs to happen because I personally really enjoy Killer Instinct. I think that a lot of people, the barrier to entry is the Xbox One and that they may not have a PC powerful enough to run it. But beyond that, well, in spite of those things, Killer Instinct is a very good fighting game, I think, and I have a lot of fun with it. So I think it deserves more spotlight. I'm total, totally in agreement with you there, for sure. Well, we, here's hoping that KI will do well in the future. But for now, sir, we must begin today's activity segment. Do you think you're prepared? I, I'm a little worried, but <laughs> let, let's see where it goes. All right, let's start the music. All right, Dalton. So, you have fact or fiction today. All FGC-related stories, however, some of them are true and some of them are false. It's going to be your job to determine, is Nathan lying to me right now or is he telling me the truth? And I don't know how easy that's going to be for you, but we're going to find out. So, are you prepared? I hope to hear some of the most outlandish things (laughs) and just be like, that's false. No, it's true. Oh, gosh. I don't think I got that crazy, but (laughs) I will take that into consideration for future factor fictions. All right. So, again, for the rules, as few as there are, three out of five questions, you win. If you get the first three right, we'll do the last two just for pride, and hopefully you will not get the dreaded defeat sound effect. I haven't had to do that too off I think only once so far this season so I don't want you to fall into that club Dalton I really don't so (laughs) here we go all right question one today's fact or fiction with Mr. Dalton Gilgamesh fell number one Justin Wong and PR Balrog took on challengers and taught new players the ropes in Street Fighter 5 at Wizard World Gaming Portland was that true or false Justin Wong and PR Rog took on challengers and taught new players the ropes in Street Fighter V at Wizard World Gaming Portland. What do you think? I want to say that's true. That is unfortunately false. (sighs) It was Justin Wong and Gutex. Oh, it was Gutex. Yep. Okay. Not PR Rog. He recently came out of hibernation now that Balrog is back in the game and he has been quoted as saying he is now rejuvenated or, you know, whatever. So, anyways. All right, that's one. Okay, number two. I think you can redeem yourself. Immediately after its announcement, upcoming Cincinnati, Ohio event, Civil War, Manifest Destiny, took heat for keeping the Confederate battle flag in its logo. True or false? Immediately after its announcement, upcoming Cincinnati, Ohio event, Civil War, Manifest Destiny, took heat for keeping the Confederate battle flag in its logo. What do you think? I want to say that's false. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, you're definitely right. That is yeah, completely I was like, incorrect. I was pulling I was your leg like, on that one. What? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, uh, I know you like updated the graphics for it. Was it a Confederate <laughs> flag before? It this? was not. It was not. <laughs> okay. Now this next one's pretty tricky, but it's 50-50, so I don't know why I told you that. Uh, anyways, Brian Cranston of Breaking Bad's fame voiced Fei Long in Street Fighter 2, the animated movie. True or false? Oh, that's true. True? Oh, very good. Nice. I know that one. (laughs) Nice. You got it. Okay. So, so far, you're you're one, you're two for three. So, one more question, you will win, but we'll see. You'll probably know this one. Oh, wait, I'll skip to the next one. Yeah, I'm going to try to trick you. 
Some players, I'm going to skip to question five, some players are concerned that Great Britain's vote to leave the European Union will interfere with travel to EVO 2016. True or false? True. Well, th there you go. Excellent. Yeah. And you have earned the victory music. Yeah. Nicely done, Dalton. Yes, it is true, folks. I read this on the NRS-related forum, Test Your Might. Some players were concerned that their European Union visas, now that they were Great Britain citizens, but also European Union, that now the visas aren't going to work. Although, from what I understand, the visas will be honored until Brexit, as it's called, actually has a plan and some action steps have taken place. So those players should be okay, but I can definitely see why they are worried. So real life stuff coming in to interfere with EVO 2016 and our friends across the pond. All right, so I didn't trick you. Very good. Well done. My mix-ups were not... I didn't have the hard read. You know what I mean? <laughs> to be honest, the one with the Civil War honestly almost got me because I was like, I don't <laughs> think that's a thing. All right, so uh, question four. You'll probably know this one. We'll see. Smash Brothers Wii U beat Street Fighter V's entrant numbers at CEO 2016 by nearly 100 entrants. True or false? What was it again? Smash Brothers Wii U beat Street Fighter V's entrant numbers at CEO 2016 by nearly 100 entrants. False? It's actually true. Oh, Smash Brothers oh. was a, about 96, 96 players more than Street Fighter V was at CEO, according to the Jabali's official statistics that he released for pre-registration numbers. That's where I got that question from. Wow. So yeah, very interesting. Smash Brothers, always an omnipresent force in the fighting game community. And I like calling Smash part of the FGC now. I don't I don't really think that any benefit happens to anybody now to sort of separate Smash from the greater FGC. I think that pretty much they're one and the same now. And that if people can't deal with that, that maybe they're a little closed-minded. I don't know. What do you think? Uh... I definitely think Smash has its own right to be in the community. It, yeah. it definitely has the numbers to be. I'm not yeah. going to argue with that. Yeah. I wonder um, how those players feel like, would they look down on me by saying, oh, yes, please come in to the FGC with my hand in the air, you know, all pompously, or would they <laughs> consider it more of like FGC tournaments crashing a Smash event? I, that, that's an interesting question. Well, I, I, uh, I like to... Some people have like uh, different opinions on it. Uh, mm. With Civil War coming up, uh, I liked that they weren't having Smash because the Smash community is such a big community that instantly when Smash is anywhere, it, it just takes over an event yeah. immediately. Yeah. And I liked the idea of kind of having a more, uh, I guess grassroots kind of type of thing mm -hmm. of um you know it's just stuff like street fighter and you know guilty gear and stuff like that because yeah. you know smash has always kind of done their own thing until like the past couple of years and i'm glad that it's you know a part of our community now i have nothing against it yeah but uh i i do agree with the fact that anytime smash is at any tournament it practically turns into a smash tournament like yeah. it 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 beats a lot of the games like with no uh no challenges at all yeah. it, it completely demolishes i mean look at evo this year even though there's 5000 street fighter players look at how, look two smash games and if i recall the year beforehand uh mr wizard said there was barely any overlap yeah. with melee and smash 4 yeah. so they you know this year they, they they practically you know they're it's out rank every yep. other fighter even street fighter 5 yep. um because you know if there's barely any overlap for those two games smash is definitely you know hitting it out of the park yeah absolutely smash is huge and i like smash brothers and i'm hoping in the future that players will cross over more and more and that the scenes will become a little bit more integrated. 
Uh, there's a really great website for doing tournaments called Smash.gg, and they mostly focus on Smash tournaments, but when bigger events roll around, bigger majors in the quote-unquote FGC, they'll often have Smash on the roster, and so Smash.gg, if the organizer chooses to use that service, will have not only the Smash games out on brackets and things that people can sign up, but then all of the more traditional quote-unquote FGC games and you know hopefully very soon I won't even have to do that quote unquote thing it'll just be it's just a FGC event and they're they're only playing smash or maybe I would encourage smash tournament organizers to maybe start running you know on the side a street fighter 5 tournament or a killer instinct tournament or a guilty gear revelator tournament or, or whatever their community dictates but maybe start expanding more if you want to go beyond just smash of course that's up to each individual organizer so all right well all right good job on your activity segment dalton that's excellent we have one more segment left folks and that is of course the listener challenge i have already put out there the listener challenge riddle for season six sorry the complete the poem for season six episode three if you would like to enter to win July's prize, you have to send me correct responses to both the Complete the Poem from Episode 3 and now today's riddle for Episode 4. Send those correct answers to powerupfighters at gmail.com and you will be entered to win a raffle for the month of July's prize. So, here comes your riddle for Season 6, Episode 4. Dalton, you are, of course, allowed to participate in the raffle if you want to go back and listen to Season 6. Don't shout out the answer if you feel like you know it for this riddle, but <laughs> please listen intently, and we'll see if you know it. This is a riddle, like I said. Here it comes. I have been both hero and villain. Though trained in solitude, I have always found myself in the limelight. I can travel around the world in under five seconds. The spirit within me has more in common with the Bengals and the Browns. What fighting game character am I? So again, one more time. Solve the riddle. I have been both hero and villain. Though trained in solitude, I have always found myself in the limelight. I can travel around the world in under five seconds. The spirit within me has more in common with the Bengals than the Browns. What fighting game character am I? Dalton, what do you think? Do you think you know the answer to today's riddle? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you can share with me after we're done recording. For now, folks, like I said, I need answers to Season 6, Episode 3, and 4's listener challenges. Send those correct responses to powerupfighters at gmail.com. If you're correct, you'll be entered to win July's prize. So, Dalton, any other plugs or things you'd like to mention for the listeners out there? Um, check me out on Twitter at <laughs> nosco underscore Gilgamesh. Um, try to make it out to Fight Fest this year at Louisville. Um, like us on Facebook and um, come to Civil War as well. I'm really hyped for that tournament, too. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in to Power Up Podcast Season 6, Episode 4, with me, your host, Nathan Shields, and my wonderful guest, my good friend, Dalton Gilgamesh Fell. We talked a lot of cool stuff about Killer Instinct and the community at large. If you like what you hear, please leave us a like, leave us a comment, subscribe if you want more, and we will catch you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>